A lot of the American church today is a product of a colonized version of Christianity. That's what happened in the beginning. And to talk honestly about indigenous history in America is to talk honestly about the church and some of the mistakes it has made. This is definitely about the color of our skins. This is about fear the fear of something different, the fear that you will be outnumbered. This idea of fear of someone taking over, someone who is different, the fear of not having power. And this is what we're seeing now, this fear of the browning of the United States. If we're not able to repent of white supremacy and to imagine ways to share power and live together, then the idea of democracy we've been trying to work on here in the United States for these centuries that we've been here, it can't work. CBS presents Race, Religion, and Resistance. Fifty years after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., violence and systemic racism remain at the heart of our nation's ills. You must disperse immediately. There's the policy violence, people who are trying to roll back what they see as Obama's legacy and trying to you know, roll back health care, roll back uh, the, the rights of immigrants to be in this country. That's impacting millions of people and that is violence, right? And that is accompanied by the kind of very physical violence that people are experiencing on the streets you know, with Nazis and Klan folks marching in their towns willing to break windows and burn stuff down and spit on people and shoot at people. This is happening in our communities. America has struggled with racism since its inception. In 1493, the doctrine of discovery justified the colonization of America by explorers like Christopher Columbus. This papal decree allowed for the seizing of indigenous land and the killing and enslavement of native people who did not convert to Christianity. Due to mass killing and other factors like disease, more than 6.5 million natives died in North America. As Americans, we have been given this story, part of whiteness is we've been given this story of discovery, right? We celebrate Columbus Day when the Americas were discovered. When as a matter of fact, what we call discovery was white people with theological justification uh, you know, coming upon a place that other people had known for, you know, thousands of years and, uh, and stealing it. It's really difficult for me as a Potawatomi person to hear that when people have the conversation about white supremacy in America or any sort of racial issue and they don't start with Columbus or start with what happened uh, during Thanksgiving or, you know, all of these stories where we have these um, examples of ways that history has been whitewashed. Caitlin Curtis is a Native American Christian author and speaker. I talk a lot about how I'm decolonizing my faith, which is, you know, just saying that over years and years, the whole point of, at least for indigenous people, the point is to assimilate, right, into American culture. The point is to become another white person. And to do that successfully means that you become fully a part of the church, especially. You become fully Christianized and you lose those aspects of your indigenous identity. And so that happened with me. Born in an Indian territory in Ada, Oklahoma, Curtis's father was a member of the Potawatomi Nation. Her mother was a non-native Christian. I was born in an Indian hospital and we lived on Indian land, um, a very poor town in Oklahoma, you know, and there were a lot of um, Native Americans, you know, in that area. Her father was a police officer for the BIA, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. You have Native Americans hired by the government to police other Natives, and it's just really, um, you can imagine how tricky that gets and how it's not always good situations. The tensions that there must have been in your policing a tribe that's probably not even your tribe, and they're seeing you as a threat. Despite living near other native people, Curtis was raised an evangelical Christian. No one in my extended family that I knew of was really practicing a lot of our cultural ways. You know, we went to powwows and we did things like that, but we were at church consistently and that was a really important part of our grounding as children. The family moved to Missouri and when she was nine, her parents divorced and her mother remarried. 
Her stepfather was a Southern Baptist pastor. I was probably like the poster child for the Southern Baptist Church. You know, I, um, I look white, you know, so I pass for any other white American teenager. And if you fit the role, if you fit the part, if you're comfortable there, it, it will take care of you. At 19, she married her husband, Travis. During college, her view of the world began to shift. I was in a world lit class and we were, we were reading stories from the Old Testament because it's literature, right? Um, and at that time, I still held my Bible to my chest. This is all literal. This is my life, you know? And we were, um, we read the story of Abraham and Isaac, you know, one day. And, um, and I was just sitting there, just kind of waiting to see what other people would say. And then I would, you know, talk about how I'm a Christian. And, <laughs> and uh, the students around me were all just like, this is such a dumb story. Or like, why would, like, God is horrible. Why would God ever do this? This is ridiculous. And, and I just sat and listened. And I remember going home and I just like, holding my Bible and crying, um, you know, to my husband, I don't understand, you know, how, how can this be? It was actually one of the first times that I was able to, to think, wow, there are people in the world who don't believe what I believe and they're good people. <laughs> and, um, and I have to understand, I have to figure out what that means. After the birth of her second child, Isaiah, she had a revelation while hiking with her family. There was just this moment where you know, just one of those epiphany moments where time stood still and it's like my focus just zoomed back in time and I was fully aware in that moment that my ancestors before me had walked the trail of death. The trail of death was the forced removal of over 850 members of the Potawatomi Nation from their native land in Indiana to a reservation in eastern Kansas in 1839. I was fully aware of my feet on the ground in that moment, thinking they walked and walked and walked, and some of them died along the way. Looking at my sons right there with me and realizing that they are the future of our tribe and they are the future of this story. And if they're going to know who they are, that has to start with me. A few months later in the fall of 2016, Curtis watched from afar as 10,000 Native Americans and non-Natives gathered at Standing Rock Reservation to block construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. It was almost a physical pain in my chest when I realized this is my legacy. I didn't get to go to Standing Rock, but watching those, those videos and realizing that there's a whole generation like me out there. And we're trying to learn our ways again and we're trying to teach our children. You know, there is a baby born on Standing Rock and um, to have something like that, like to have other women who are wanting to raise their children to know who they are and to fight against systems that oppress. Um, I realized how much I need to be a part of that. Our society right now, people just don't Curtis still attends a Christian church and is part of a multiracial group that meets regularly and talks about race. It's called Be the Bridge. It's a space for people of color to speak with and be listened to and not be constantly interrupted with, but, oh, but this, but, you know, with, with the constant um, wanting to explain it. To them, it's just listening. You just get bombarded. I mean, it's February. And <laughs> every, time it's, every time it's February, it's Black History Month. Then you get the, yeah, when are we going to have a White History Month? What? Is that, that it? You've never oh, heard Lord. this? You've never heard this? <laughs> Discussing heard race with members of her church and learning the language of the Potawatomi are helping Curtis reclaim her cultural and spiritual identity. Okay. Do you remember a shirt? Black. Beast. Be Good job. The first time I listened to the Potawatomi language, it was deeply sacred. Like something I had never heard, but like somehow it was inside of me, but I didn't know it. It's like your heart language and you didn't know that it was there. It, was, it felt like that. And and so learning even just little words like the word for bacon, or, you know, coco shuias, like even just hearing the boys say that is it, so meaningful. And for them to know that language is attached to your identity, you know, Language is attached to a deeper part of who you are than just words that you're speaking. She hopes that the act of deconstructing her faith for herself and for the church inspires others to do the same.
If we can't start by listening to people of color, I don't know where the church is gonna go from here. I honestly right now can't really tell like which side is winning, but I do know that a lot of people are deconstructing their faith from when they were younger growing up in the evangelical church like I'm doing. Um, I know a lot of white people that are deconstructing it and trying to understand and trying to be better allies and trying to be humble and listen, you know, and not talk so much. And that gives me hope. Coming up. The central policy of white supremacy in America right now is a commitment to anti-immigrant forces. I mean, one of the things we have to grapple seriously with is that the Christian church, especially in the South in the 19th century, invested serious money in what they called slave evangelization. Last night, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove is an evangelical minister from the South. So the Christian duty of a slaveholder was to evangelize his slaves. It was give them the good news of the gospel, which is that your soul can be saved and you can go to heaven when you die. But right now you're going back to the field. Before the Civil War, Christian slaveholders used the Bible to justify slavery. Frederick Douglass was the person who named in his autobiography the difference between the Christianity of the slaveholder and the Christianity of Christ. And there was so much of that slaveholder religion, you know, that said it would be immoral, it would be wrong to challenge or even to break the law of the land. Douglass said, oh, no, no. If I read this Bible right, Jesus was breaking the law when the Romans decided to kill him. And, uh, and we're going to have to break some laws too because it, when, when the law is used to hurt people, when the law is used to hold people down, it's an immoral law. And like Dr. King taught us, an unjust law is no law at all. With the end of the Civil War came the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. It did not, however, put an end to the practice of slaveholder religion. According to Wilson Hartgrove, it continues even today. Slaveholder religion is the religion that says, I am better than somebody else fundamentally because I'm white, right? By some accident of birth, I'm better than other people. And therefore, you know, uh, uh, the only charity I can imagine is somehow, you know, uh, giving from my greatness to help somebody else. That's so spiritually sick. That's what's killing us. Wilson Hartgrove grew up Baptist in North Carolina. He lived and preached slaveholder religion. A lot of religious people have been duped. We've been hoodwinked. I was duped. I grew up in this. So, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to stand in judgment over against anybody. The nation doesn't come back to he was a member of the moral majority. The thing that I most remember from being in the moral majority in the mid-90s was how much it taught us to hate poor people. Founded by the Reverend Jerry Falwell, the moral majority was a political organization created to promote conservative social values. We told ourselves story after story of people abusing the system, you know, trying to trick us, trying to work the system in order to justify our unwillingness you know, to do anything to change the structural realities. When you walk around the world thinking that everybody is trying to trick you, that is a, that is a soul-destroying sort of thing. This is about changing the moral narrative in this country. Today, Since Wilson Hartgrove is trying to change the way white people think about race and religion. I was so caught up in the Southern strategy and, you know, its religious connection to the moral majority that you know, I, I couldn't see a way out of it. But that's what I was saved from, right? The, the gospel that I preach saved me from that sort of self-deception. No one wants to believe they're a racist, right? That's a bad word. It's a bad idea. Um, but I think, I think people do want to be free from fear. So when I talk to white people who've been duped by this, you know, Southern strategy that's pitted them against their black and brown neighbors for generations, I, I like to talk to them about what are you afraid of? Meanwhile, an interfaith resistance movement has emerged in response to the current administration's policies on everything from health care to immigration. Woo! <laughs>
While Congress stalls on immigration reform, faith leaders and their allies are out in force protesting the administration's plan to end protection for recipients of DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. In the spirit of this loving, uh, just God to say no more. 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 The same forces that want to get rid of DACA want to deport their parents, want to end family reunification policies, want to really transform the fundamental approach to immigration in this country uh, to, to, to essentially stem the browning of America, right? This is the fundamental point, that white supremacy has been challenged throughout the history of this country but the political reality right now is that white supremacy cannot continue after 2040 if we're a democracy, right? There simply won't be the votes for it. You know, there's nothing new under the sun. The question is, what do you do with your moment under the sun? Wilson Hartgrove has joined longtime ally, the Reverend William Barber, and others in calling for a nationwide resistance movement. In May, thousands of people in at least 25 states will participate in 40 days of nonviolent direct action targeting state legislatures and Congress. It's called the Poor People's Campaign. There is a resistance in the country right now, and the resistance says something is wrong. This notion that in order for us to be a great nation, we have to keep other people out. In order for you know, us to be wealthy, you know, we, we gotta make sure other people don't get too much money. Uh, all of those kind of forces are divisive and they have been used by politicians in the history of this country um, to divide people who have common interests against one another. Strangers who come from other lands seeking life. The challenge of God is that we treat them as our own family. We want a democracy that works and we're willing to make sacrifices. We're willing to put our bodies on the line to change the conversation in the country about uh, what our shared life is really about. Coming up. It's horrible to have to live every single day justifying your existence in this country, justifying your worth. It is very satisfying to be able to walk with people in their darkest moments and in their moments of joy. Hello, good to see you. Reverend Nancy Frausto is Associate Rector at St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Long Beach, California. It is a privilege to be part of their lives as they encounter God in different ways, but also as they struggle. St. Luke's is a multiracial congregation that offers two services on Sunday, one in English and one in Spanish. When I preach the Latino congregation, I need to remind myself that I am preaching to a community that has been dehumanized, that they have no power and no control over their lives. En su dolor, en su enfermedad, en su depresión, en su tristeza, Jesús camina con ustedes. Y aunque el camino es duro, no estamos solos. It's difficult to be reminded that you are loved and you are worthy when everywhere you hear that you are a criminal, that you deserve the worst of the worst, that you don't deserve to be in this country. On September 5th, 2017, the administration announced its plan to rescind deferred action for childhood arrivals, also known as DACA. I'm here today to announce that the program known as DACA that was effectuated under the Obama administration is being rescinded. DACA gives protected status to undocumented immigrants who came to this country as children. They are sometimes called dreamers. My reaction when I heard that DACA had been rescinded was anger and tears. I, ju I remember just kind of looking up and saying, all right, God, now what? I haven't seen you forever, you're a grown up. Jorge Robago is one of over 600,000 DACA recipients. Frosto mentored him in a church youth group when he was a young boy. I've already been doing this for six years. 
So, oh, you got it right in the beginning yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. Today, he is 20 years old and works as okay. an assistant so mechanic remember, um, for the state of California. I love this. Pleasant personality and works extremely well with others. Ready to lend a hand when asked. Jorge shows up from work early and takes really pride in his duties. That's from my boss. Jorge displays outstanding character, professional attitude, and excellent work ethic, and is truly an asset. Love it. Rabalga's DACA so, paperwork so expires copies, in seven so days. So Without renewal, he could be deported. Frausto is also a DACA recipient. When she was seven, she left her home in Mexico to reunite with her father, who was working legally in Los Angeles. It is a journey she will never forget. Ran across the mountains in the middle of the night, helicopter lights chasing us, throwing ourselves down in the middle of the mountains, hoping the immigration trucks wouldn't run over us. Drug and gang-related violence remains a threat for many. But for Frosto and her family, the decision to leave Mexico was still not that easy. God, no, it's not like you wake up one morning and say, I'm bored, let's, you know, switch our whole life around, let's struggle uh, just for the hell of it. Like, this is the hard decision people have to make. While her parents juggled multiple jobs, Frosto took care of her siblings. I just remember it would be pick up my brother, cook, pick up my sister, feed them, help them with their homework, do my homework. There'd be some nights where I would be up to the middle, middle of the night um, doing my work, but it was something we had to do. Faith and religion were a big part of her life. While other people would refuse to open the doors to the Jehovah's Witness, I would get up really early on Saturday morning, clean my house, have coffee ready, for when they would come, I would invite them in, and we would just talk about God. She eventually found her spiritual home in the Episcopalian Church. At the age of 16, while serving as an acolyte, she received her calling to become a priest. But her dream nearly ended when she learned she was undocumented. Everybody was filling out their college applications, and they would ask for a Social Security number. And I had no idea what that was. And then when we're filling financial aid forms, I couldn't. So even though um, I applied to a couple of universities and I was accepted, I could not pay for them. Her local church stepped in and started a scholarship fund to put her through school. In 2013, she graduated with a Master's of Divinity from Claremont School of Theology in California. You can start, go ahead and, and fill that out. Um, this, when, when does it um, expire? Since joining St. Luke's, the administration's anti-immigration tactics have affected her ministry. My plan was not to battle with bail bond companies. My plan was not to, you know, to study law in the middle of the night so you can understand the terms and contracts. So, estoy trabajando and como ya regreso Anne. A typical day consists of a visit with an asylum seeker from Honduras who is living in sanctuary in the church. Alex Bruholz was nearly deported back to Honduras after fleeing death threats from gangs. After living in detention for eight months, the church was able to bail him out. I need to get some information regarding paying their bail bond and removing the bracelet, the ankle bracelet. Then Frosto spends part of her day on the phone with a bail bond company to work out how to pay off his debt. What are the possibilities of receiving a copy of the contract in English? Meanwhile, an email comes in stating her mother's visa, allowing her return to the United States as a permanent resident, has been approved. Filmando, sí. Okay? All right, I love you, Mama. Bye, Mama. It feels like I am in a roller coaster every single day. Like there's these like super high ups and downs. I wish people didn't have to go through everything they have to go through and jump the many hoops they have to jump just to stay in this country and be seen as human beings. Since President Trump took office, there's been a 42% increase in deportation of undocumented immigrants living in the United States. This is so about race. I have often sat in this sanctuary in prayer and ask God, why? 
why are there so many people that feel just because of their Anglo-Saxon heritage, why do they feel that they're better than others? Let's look at the way that our indigenous brothers and sisters were treated. They stole their country. Our African-American brothers and sisters, they were brought in chains. They were not human enough, they were just labor. Reverend Frausto is an incarnational expression of the way the gospel is supposed to function. This whole idea of trying to dehumanize us, dehumanize us and criminalize us because we are immigrants is ridiculous. The fundamental American proposition is that we are a nation not of ethnic identity, nor gender identity, nor religious identity, but of human identity. And there's part of our character because it's in the nature of privilege to fear that someone is trying to get what we have. We're going through a moment of resistance to what our destiny is. I think the job of the church is to help civic America have a better understanding of what its destiny is by proclaiming who Christ really was. To view this program and others like it, go to cbsnews.com slash religion and culture.